Thank you for joining us today as we look at Psalm 95 together. Now, I'm not sure that we know who wrote this psalm, but we do know that it would have been used as a call to worship in the temple, so it would have been read out by the priests or Levites. As I read through it now, you might like to listen out for two things. Firstly, for what it tells us about God's greatness, and also for what it tells us about some of the ways that we can worship God. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Let's begin at looking at what it tells us about God. Firstly, the psalmist uses a, a, diff, a number of different names for God. Firstly, rock, a picture of God's unfailing strength as a refuge and deliverer to those that believe and trust in him. Then Lord, one of the names the Bible uses for God that shows just how holy he is. Then in verse three, we read that he is the great God, the king above all gods. Verse 3 and 4 speak of God as the one who created the universe and everything in it. Within the ancient pagan world, people believed that there were different gods for different parts of the world. But here we see that the Lord God is great and powerful enough to be sovereign over every part of this vast universe. And there's no bit of it that is not within his care and control. Then we're reminded that God is our maker. And verse 7 says, he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Picturing us as sheep and therefore God as our shepherd who cares for us. All of these things show us what a great God our God is. Let's look now at what our great God deserves from us. Quite simply, he deserves our worship. Worship is all about us showing God how worthy we think he is. We're told to sing for joy and shout aloud, to extol or praise him with thanksgiving, music and song, to bow down and kneel before him. The final few verses of the psalm look back at the past and I think also point forward to a time in the future. You might have noticed how the way the psalm is written changes a bit here. So far, it's as though God's people are talking about him. And now it sounds as though God is talking to his people, reminding them of their past when he delivered their ancestors from slavery in Egypt. But instead of worshipping him for the great thing he had done for them, they complained and wished he had left them in Egypt. And because of this, God stopped many of his people from entering the land that he had promised he would give them a land of their own where they would have, have everything they needed to settle and live. And the rest that we read about at the end of the psalm is another meaning for that promised land. But what does that rest mean for us today? Well, Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 9 and 10 can help us out a bit here. They say this, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. 
The promised land, the rest that the Israelites entered into, was just a shadow of what was and is to come. God rested from his work of creation on the seventh day, and it's this, God's own rest, that we today are offered a share in. When we submit ourselves fully to God, he who created tomorrow and is in control of all our tomorrows can guide us and lead us there with assurance and in safety. This doesn't make us immune to life's heartaches and dangers, but when we have faith in God, and as a result of that are obedient to him, we can know his rest. Just as God required faith and obedience from the Israelites when they were to enter their promised rest, so too God requires faith in Jesus' death and resurrection from us if we are to share in his rest. There's nothing we can do to attain this most precious of gifts. We just have to put our own selves to one side and submit instead to God, relying on him completely. And then God's own rest can become our rest. So quite a challenge for us today, but a wonderful promise too. I'm just going to leave a few moments of quiet now for you to perhaps pray your own prayers or think your own thoughts about what we've just heard. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reminder of your supremacy and your sovereign rule over all the earth and over all other gods. Help us to worship you with songs of joy and loud shouts in the way you deserve all the days of our lives. Thank you that when we believe and trust in you, you invite us to share in your very own rest. Help us to completely rely on you so that we can know the fullness of your promised rest, now and forever. Amen.